I admire him because I feel he was single-minded and very brave in very difficult times to be like that. I think he was someone who worked tirelessly to give back to his community, both the, the, the poor and the needy, and those who were well-established and uh, sort of intellectual and uh, quite wealthy as well. So he really reached out to, to all sorts of people in the community, worked very hard on their behalf. Born in 1856, William Henry Quilliam was the son of a wealthy watchmaker and became a solicitor after training at the Liverpool Institute. He was a wonderful grandfather, he loved children, and he used to come to the house at Christmas, and he used to bring fabulous presents, and our eyes used to pop out because he was a very generous man, and he just sort of had a, a very, very special appearance. He used to always wear a frock coat with an astrakhan collar. He was a wonderful grandfather, he loved children, and he used to come to the house at Christmas and he used to bring fabulous presents and our eyes used to pop out because he was a very generous man and he just sort of had a, a very, very special appearance. He used to always wear a frock coat with an astrakhan collar mm -hmm. and he used to have long hair over his astrakhan collar and he always wore tails and striped trousers and that was his permanent uniform. That's how he always dressed. He was what is, was known in those days as a poor man's solicitor. In other words, in his practice, it, and in Liverpool where he had his big practice, they used to have what they called in Liverpool Mary Aarons, who were the flower women that used to sell flowers in the street. And uh, they all had daughters that had illegitimate children, <laughs> and they used to go to my grandfather to get paternity orders to make the father pay for these illegitimate children. When he used to go through the streets, the flower women used to throw their flowers under his carriage out of, out of gratitude because he never charged them. They used to come to him and they used to say, will you take a paternity order for my daughter? And they used to say to him, we haven't got any money. And my grandfather said, well, what have you got? and they'd hold their hand out and there'd be a shilling in the middle of their palm mm. and he'd say, no, you keep that, but I'll take your case. But life as a lawyer took its toll on Quilliam and in 1882 he travelled to Morocco and Algeria and it was there that his fascination with Islam began. At the age of 31 he reverted to Islam and took the name Abdullah. Returning to Liverpool, Abdullah began to spread Islam among the masses as Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam. And it was then that he really engaged with the British white community in Liverpool and brought them to the faith as well. Uh, he was able to explain and express Islam in terms that they understood and um, that was important to them in terms of their own culture, their own principles, their own values. Abdullah Quilliam was a foresighted individual that engaged with his community regardless of whether it was Muslim or non-Muslim. Very simply, there were not many Muslims around. And of course, the local Christian communities were up in arms. And there were a lot of press criticism, even then, nothing new, I suppose. Those are the key challenges. But I think more importantly, the biggest challenge they faced was to keep up with their faith, practice it. They were quite bold in sharing it with others, so I don't think they were very shy about it. So those were the challenges. He was very brave and he threw all convention to the wind and he just sort of did his own thing. He was certainly uh, his own person and he just didn't care. I mean, he was criticized and they used to throw stones at him. He didn't bat an eyelid. He just carried on with what he personally believed in and wanted and that was that. Abdullah Quillam is what we could call a pioneer for the whole world and for many, many Muslims and has an, an astonishing legacy that he left behind. He came from a, um, a Methodist background and he was also uh, one of the uh, legal eagles in the city as well. And um, for him to move away from that and come into Islam um, must have been, uh, must have affected the social life and his also social standing. Particularly after he 
converted to Islam. He did a lot of work in the community to support children. He founded an orphanage in Liverpool, also schools and uh, an institute of learning. He was a person who believed uh, what, his, what he felt strongly about. And in, in 1889, he strongly felt about his belief as a Muslim uh, to introduce Islam in, in, the, in, the, in England. And in those days, of course, Liverpool being a port and a very busy port, one of the busiest ports, the ships used to come in with the Lascars on them. All the, all the crew of these boats coming into Liverpool were mostly Muslims, and they used to get off the boat and go flat on their faces on the pier head, facing Mecca and praying. And my gra that started my grandfather off because he saw this happening and he thought, that's absolutely appalling. They've got no official place where they can worship. They're doing it in the street because there's nowhere they can go. That's when he built the mosque. He built the mosque and he used to call them to prayer in Arabic from the, from the minaret in, at the Liverpool Mosque. Mm -hmm. As soon as the boats used to come into harbour, they'd just go to the mosque when it was built. And it is at Eid Braham Terrace that Abdullah Quilliam established the first independent mosque in the UK. Currently the building is in an abandoned state, but we are joined by Dr. Muhammad Akbar Ali, the chairman of the Abdullah Quilliam Society, who will be taking us a tour of the building and showing us the potential for restoration of the building. So let's take a look inside. So this is the main entrance of the building. It was the main entrance to the mosque, although the entrance is over there at the back, but this had an archway with a crescent and a star, which probably you'll see in the magazines, photographs that were taken at that time. Unfortunately, a lot of it has been removed from here now, but that was the main entrance to the prayer hall. So you mentioned um, Abdullah Quilliam being a solicitor and his involvement in many publishing works. So let's go and find out where he conducted these publishing. Right, certainly. So Abdullah Quilliam as a solicitor, um, that was his profession. But what were some of his other literary accomplishments? Well, yes, he was very fond of writing and also of making speeches because that was one of his ways of uh, convincing people of the truth he had discovered himself. And of course, one of the publications, main publication was um, the Crescent. In Amel, we decided to take the Crescent newsletters. The, the, the Crescent was Abdullah Quilliam's newsletters that he produced um, that were a record of his time. And we decided to reproduce articles from them every month in Amel that was from a month, the same month. So if it was January 18, whatever, we would produce it January in, in now 2008. And we decided to do this so, because it was a great reflection of British Islam going back almost 200 years ago. And it's this fantastic um, insight, window if you like, onto this, this community that was very engaged with its local community. We wanted to show um, what that community was like before really the war, the First World War, completely tore that community asunder and it was never seen again really. As you know, Abdullah William was a very, very charismatic figure. And in 1908, he had to go to Turkey because he had very close relationship with the Sultan of Turkey. And I think it was mainly political reasons why he had to go there. And he spent quite some time, a number of years, away from the base which was here in Liverpool. During that period, unfortunately, a lot of people who had become Muslims under his influence and who were still remain Muslims because of him, they gradually left the community and dispersed throughout England. But fortunately, a lot of them went to Woking, which was the other contemporary mosque in England at that time, and they settled there. And when Abdullah William returned from Turkey after a long period, he found that his, the community he had established has disappeared. And uh, he found that they, most of them had gone to Woking. So he also joined them in Woking. The center of Islam, which was established in Liverpool, shifted its center to the south of England in Woking. Why is it important this, that this center is restored? Well, what can we do to help? It is so important because it is the legacy of a genuinely indigenous British Muslim. Mm -hmm. And since we have decided to stay in this country, it is our duty 
to hold up that heritage and uh, and maintain it as much as, as far as we can and that is why we are striving very hard to get some funding so that we can restore the reputation of Liverpool uh, 